You want to clap? Okay, go ahead and clap. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to be with you in the quiet today. This is leaders' session. Something is coming your way. This one will change your life, will change your ministry, will change the work of God in your hands. You will grow. Grow higher. Grow taller. Grow bigger. You move forward. You move upward. Something great will happen to you. Father, we thank you today for this workers' meeting, workers' leaders' development session. Lord, we thank you for our leaders, for our workers, for our pastors, for our group pastors, for men and women serving you in this locality. Lord, we ask you today that you send forth the word of power to every life tonight in Jesus' name. Increase your people. Multiply your people. Strengthen your people. Energize your people. Empower your people. Move us forward. Move us upward in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have done it. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Job chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 7. Job chapter 8, verse 7. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. You didn't hear that very well. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. As we come to this verse of scripture today, we're looking at this for the individual. We're looking at this for the family. We're looking at this for the church. We're looking at it for our community. We're looking at this for the minister. We're looking at this for the local church. We're looking at this for the whole church in all this area. That even though the word of God is telling us our beginning was small, our latter end is going to greatly increase. This word is found in the book of Job. You might have heard the story of Job, but you don't understand. Job was a true believer. God himself testified of Job. He was blessed. He was prospered. God himself pronounced him perfect. And he asked Satan, he said, Have you found my servant Job? That in all the world at that time, there is none like him. Perfect. He refused evil. And yet, the Bible records that he suffered and he had setbacks. He had reverses in life. If you read the first two chapters of Job, you'll find accidents happened. Fire broke out and burnt his property. You'll find the building collapsed and killed his children. What are the lessons there? Accidents are not necessarily punishment. You know the story of Job? He was not being punished. He had not done anything evil. And so you must understand, accidents may happen. Now we know the story of Job. And we know that Satan was behind that accident. It wasn't that God was punishing him. He himself had a painful disease. And then to him, it was mysterious. Because he couldn't understand because he didn't have the conversation that went on between God and Satan concerning him. Eventually, he was reduced to the zero level. And what this scripture is telling us here, in chapter 8, verse 7, look at that again. Though 
Thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end shall greatly increase. He was reduced to zero, but he climbed up to the zenith. From zero to the zenith. That means from the ground level to the sky. That means from small to the significant. You look at your life. You look at your ministry. You look at what you're doing today. And you might be at level zero. Ground zero. But you are going to increase. You are going to multiply. And then you understand. Although you are small today. Tomorrow you are going to be significant. You are little now. But you are going to become large. And it appears you are few. But you are going to be fruitful. Eventually, how did things turn around? That by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, by the power of the Lord, this man, Job, that was like at the zero level, then was lifted up to the zenith. How did this happen? Look at chapter 42. In chapter 42, I'm reading from verse 5. I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye sees thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and tell me the next word. I can't hear you. Tell me that word, and repent in dust and ashes. As you look at Job, he said, but we read in chapter 1 that God said he was perfect. Now he's seen and repent. The question is, does a perfect Christian repent? Now he's telling us, I've heard you. I've seen you. I consider now what I never knew, what I never considered. Between chapter 3 and chapter 36, Job said a lot of things he didn't understand. When we get into problems, we might say things we don't understand. My thinking ways, we don't understand. When we have challenges, we don't go into sin. Look at Job. He didn't divorce his wife. Look at Job. He didn't go into the sins of the flesh. Look at Job. When he lost everything, he didn't go to steal. Look at Job. When those people came and they accused him and they said, you must be a sinner. There must be something wrong with you. That's why this happened. He didn't fight them. He didn't abuse them. He didn't insult them. He did not sin in the normal understanding of sinning. But now that God spoke to him, he said, I repent in dust and ashes. Look at verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. He'll turn your captivity. And then it says, also, the latter part, the Lord gave Job. The Lord gave Job. Are you still at home? The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Did you see the fulfillment of the prophecy? That even though your beginning is small, even though you are reduced to zero level, you are coming up higher. You are going to be greater. You are going to be more fruitful. How did it happen unto him? Number one, repent. Number two, receive. Number three, reproduce. Number one, repent. Look at Job chapter 42, verse 5, verse 6. I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye sees thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and, tell me the word again, repent in dust and ashes. I asked you a question earlier. How do you see that a perfect man is repenting? I see it a man who is a believer. I see it a man who is a good person. 
I see the man who is righteous. How is he saying, I repent. I say, we're reading from chapter 42, verse 19. I say, chapter 42, verse 19. Here now we are told about the perfect man. In chapter 42, verse 19 of Isaiah, here the word of God tells us, Who is blind but my servant, my servant Job. He was blind to the discussion that went on between God and Satan. He was blind to the source of the problem that he had. How is it all the children died? How is it that accident happened? How is it the fire came from the sky and burnt everything that he had? He was ignorant. Even though he was perfect. Perfect in character, but blind in knowledge. Look at this. Or deaf as my messenger that I said. Who is blind, but he that is, tell me the word, perfect and blind as the Lord's servant. Because he didn't understand all the things that took place, a perfect man, a righteous man, a holy man. And he didn't understand. In his confusion, he said things he shouldn't have said. He replied those people the way he shouldn't have replied them. He accused God falsely. He said, God, look at what you have done to me. Look at what is happening to me. He didn't even mention Satan at all. He didn't know there are evil spirits at all. He didn't know there were demons at all. He didn't know there were wicked people. He was just talking about God. You did this to me, God. You did this to me, God. You did this to me. And now he said, he didn't go to sin. He didn't go to backslide. He didn't go to become drunkard. He didn't go to have, he didn't divorce his wife. Even when the wife said, cause God and die. No, he wouldn't do that. He was a perfect man, but he wasn't perfect in knowledge. And because he wasn't perfect in knowledge, he said, now I understand. I hear God now. I see God now. He talks to me now. I abhor myself. I repent in dust and ashes. Number one. For you to come from the zero level and get your descendants. For you to come from small to significant. And for you to come from little to large. You repent. Number two, receive. You received the promise of God. Look at Job chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 22. Job chapter 22. Verse 22, if you're moving from zero level to the zenith level, repentance, not just the first step, that's not the final step. 22, verse 22, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. The word of promise, lay it up in your heart. The word of prophecy, lay it up in your heart. The word of his love, lay it up in your heart. The word of his mercy, lay it in your heart. Receive from the Lord. Look at verse 28. Thou shalt also, after you receive the word, after you receive the promise, after you receive that prophecy upon your life, today a prophecy is coming upon your life. I believe you are receiving it. It says, even though that beginning was small, your latter end will greatly increase. Lord, I receive that. Lord, I receive that. That is mine. I said that is mine. It will happen to you. Verse 28, Thou shalt also decree a sin, and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon thy ways. One, one, repent. Two, receive. Three, reproduce. We're coming to Job chapter 42, verses 12 and 13. Job chapter 42, verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Is that going to happen to you? 
he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camel and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses and he had also and he had also you don't like his daughters and he had also seven sons and three daughters. Hold on. Look at the miracle here. He had before seven sons and three daughters born by one woman. And when a woman has given birth to three children, four children, five children, that's much. And then ten children at the beginning. Now, all of them died in that accident caused by the devil. And the wife came and said, Are you still holding to your integrity? Cause God and die. And he said, You speak like one of the foolish women speak. Shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not receive evil? And then he did not divorce her. They stayed together. And God healed him. Like God is going to heal you. God delivered him. Like God is going to deliver you. And that same woman. Received a miracle of renewal. That after bearing ten children. Now she started all over again. One. Two. Three. Four. Help me now. Five. Six. Seven. And then one. Two, three daughters, ten again. And she was still strong. That's a miracle. Your wife will be strong. Your husband will be strong. There's no divorce. There's no separation. Whatever happened before, she didn't understand. She didn't understand. That's why she said what she said. And now they were still united together. Families are getting united together tonight. Reproduce. Reproduce. That's what happened there. That, that means that today I'm talking to you on our supernatural expansion from a small beginning. That's the topic tonight. Our supernatural expansion from a small beginning. You will expand. Three points we are going to consider. Number one. The sincere penitence of a suffering Christian. The sincere penitence of a suffering Christian. Number two, the soaring progress, soar. That means to fly up, to go up. And to go up, that so much, the people on ground, they will not see you there. Any arrow they throw to you there will not reach you. You are so up there that no evil again coming from the sea, coming from the ground, can touch your life anymore. The soaring progress of a small congregation. Of a small congregation. This is a congregation and today it appears small. But that congregation is going to grow. Point number three. The saints penetration of a shielded community. The saints penetration of a shielded community. That means a community that is closed up. They lock the gates. No soul winner will come here. No evangelist will come here. No preacher will come here. And they lock themselves behind the iron gate of tradition and religion. But we are going to penetrate. We're going to cross the river over there. And on that side, we're going to penetrate. On this side, on the island, we're going to penetrate. Because the saints have come. And we have the promise of God in our hand. We have the promises and the prophecies of the Lord in our hand. We will overcome. We will penetrate. And we're going to reach everywhere in Jesus' name. Number one, tell me number one. We're looking at number one now, and it is the sincere penitence of a suffering Christian. Let's come back to chapter 42. 
chapter 42 of Job. I'm reading from verse 3. For chapter 42, verse 3. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. This is the confession he's making now to God. He said, God, I didn't go to commit sin, but here is what I've discovered now as we talk together. As you reveal yourself to me, as you open everything to me now, here is what I discover. I have uttered things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. That's why he said in verse 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, I despise myself, I look down myself, I humiliate myself, I'm sorry for myself, I repent in dust and ashes. What's he talking about? What's he saying that he said that he didn't understand? What's he repenting about? And what's the sincere penitence of a suffering Christian? Look at chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 23. Chapter 3, verse 23. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God has hedged in? He said, God, you are my problem. You hedge me in. You restrict me. You've killed my children. You've taken my cattle. He said, God is the one that did this to me. That's what he was repenting about later. Look at chapter, chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 4. It says, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. The poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. He said, the work Satan was doing, he said, God was doing that. He said, God is the one persecuting me. God is the one punishing me. God is the one, his arrows, they terrify me. His arrows and the poison, they drink up my spirit and then my life is dry now. You see, that's what he was repenting about. He said, God, I didn't know your love when I was in that suffering, when I was in that sickness, when the boys came all over me. I said, God, what have I done? Why are you doing this to me? That's why now he said, I repent. Now I understand. I said things that were mysterious to me. And things I couldn't understand. Things I couldn't see. Look at chapter 7. Verse 19. In chapter 7 verse 19. Here is Joe talking. How long will thou not depart from me? Not let me alone. Till I swallow down my spittle. I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee? O thou preserver of men. Why hast thou set me as a mark against thee, so that I am a burden to myself? He was talking to God. That's what he repented about. He said, my words to you, almighty God, were sharp. They were hard. When I went through those painful conditions, and then I couldn't discover myself. I couldn't find myself. That's why I spoke the way I spoke. But now I see you. I see your face. And I see your love. And I see your compassion. And I see your mercy. Lord, there's only one thing I will do. I repent in dust and ashes. We're looking at chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 17. Look at this. Chapter 9, verse 17. For he breaketh me with a tempest. He's talking about God. He multiplies my wounds without cause. He said, I've done nothing. I've been serving him. I've been worshiping him. And I've been obedient to all his word. And now look at what God is doing to me. He multiplies my wounds without cause. He goes on to say in chapter, in verse 18. He will not suffer me to take my breath. But he filleth me with bitterness. It was when he saw God later, he said, God, how could I have said that? My thoughts were wrong. My mind was wrong. My utterance was wrong. I repent in dust and ashes. Look at verse 22. This is one thing, therefore I said it. It destroys the perfect and the wicked. 
Look at what Job said. Job said, I look at my heart, I cannot find any sin. I look at my heart, I cannot find any misbehavior. I look at my life, I cannot find any, dis any kind of disobedience. I am perfect. And God said, yes, you are perfect. But you say, I'm perfect. I know I'm perfect. Your spirit is bearing witness with me, I'm perfect. And yet, look at what you're doing to me. You do the same thing to me like you're doing to the wicked. You're punishing me unjustly. That's why he said, when he now knew the truth later, he said, Lord, how could I have said that? I repent. It's the sincere penitence of a suffering Christian. He was a believer, but was suffering. And he didn't have any explanation for his suffering. Because of that, he said, Oh, I'm sorry I said what I said. I'm sorry I thought the way I thought. I shouldn't have thought like that. A perfect man repenting. Look at chapter 10. In chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 2 and verse 3. I will say unto God, I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me whereof thou contest, contendest with me. God, it's like when a battle. It's like when a warfare. And my warfare is now with the almighty God. But won't you show me God? Why you are doing this to me? Look at verse 3. Is it good unto thee, O God, that thou shouldest oppress, that thou shouldest despise the work of thy hands? And shine upon the counsel of the wicked. He said, in our community here, I've not even seen the wicked suffering as I'm suffering. I've not seen the sinners suffering as I'm suffering. You're shining your sunshine upon the wicked. And here I am in darkness. Why are you doing, doing this to me? He didn't understand. That's why later now, if you're going to go from zero level, and you're going to go to the zenith, if you're going to go from small and go to significant, if you're going to go from little and go to large, you must look at what you have been saying. What you have been saying to God. How you have been thinking about God. And if things are wrong, thank God you are a believer. Thank God you are a minister. Thank God you are a preacher. Thank God you didn't go to the sins of the world. We're not talking about that. But now you come and you say, Lord, see the way I've been talking about myself and about your church and about you, the, the almighty God. Now I repent. We're coming to chapter 12, verse 6. Chapter 12, verse 6. The tabernacle of robbers prosper. And they provoke God. They that provoke God are secure. Into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. You know what he was saying? He said, Job said, God, can I talk to you about your dealings? Can I talk to you about your operations? I see that the wicked people, you bless them abundantly. Look at that man. Look at that woman. Look at those worldly people. And look at how you overload them and overload them. And look at me here. And look at the way I am in penury and in nothing. And this is the way you are rewarding me for my goodness, my holiness, and all my perfection. What are you doing to me? That's why when he now saw later, Lord, he said, am I the one that said that? Am I the one that thought like that? I'm sorry. I repaid in dust and ashes. You are telling the Lord, you look at the work of God that you are doing. Yes, thank God. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I'm holy. Seek ye for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Thank God I'm righteous. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, I never miss Bible study. I never miss fellowship. I never miss the service. I'm always there. But when there are reverses in life, but when there are setbacks in life and you cannot understand the things you think, the comparisons you make, all these people, occultic people, they're rich. Look at me here. All these other people, the people that are not serving God, they don't even know the first elements of holiness. I know the root, I know the stem, I know the branches of holiness, and praise the Lord, I'm holy, but what do I have? What can I show for it? And then when God now talks to you and he said, what did you say? And then you realize, 
Even though you didn't go to the seas of the world, now you are saying, I'm sorry about this. How did I think like that? How did I talk like that? We're coming to chapter 13, verse 21. Chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 21. In chapter 13, verse 21, here is Job again. Only do not two things unto me. Then I will not hide myself from thee. Withdraw thy hand far from me. And let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. He said, God, I don't even want you to talk to me. And I don't want to talk to you. But, okay, if I'm going to talk to you, if you're going to talk to me, tell me, what have I done? Tell me, why are you doing this to me? Tell me, why this, why that? That's his attitude to God. That's what he now saw later when God appeared and when God spoke to him and said, Job, you know who you are talking to? Who you are talking about? Do you know about your complaint? Do you know about your murmuring? Do you know about the things you said? He said, Lord, did I understand when that pain struck my body? When that thing racked my body and I rolled on the ground and I didn't know I was between life and death. That's why I said those foolish things. I repent. In dust and ashes. Please forgive me. The Lord will forgive you. Yeah. Chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 19. Chapter 14. Verse 19. The, water, the waters were the stones. That washes away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth. Thou destroyest the hope of them, the hope of man. You say, God, I don't have any hope anymore. And you are responsible. You have destroyed my hope. When everything was all right, and I claimed the promises, and I prayed, and everything was all right, and then I had things in surplus, I had hope. But now, God, you have taken my hope away. You did it to me. I didn't want to backslide. I didn't want to say anything wrong. But look at what you're doing to me. That is what when he now realized the way he had been speaking. That's why he now said, I repent in dust and ashes. We're coming to chapter 16, verse 11. 16, 11. God has delivered me to the ungodly. He has turned me over into the hands of the wicked. God, I can't even find you again. You're not answering my prayer again. You are not helping me anymore. You have handed me over to the ungodly. And you have turned me over unto the wicked. I was at ease. But he has broken me asunder. He has also taken me by the, back, by the neck. And shaken me to pieces. And set me up for his mark. He was talking to God. It was later when he realized. He said. How could I have said that? How can man say that to the creator? How can man say that to his helper? How can man say that to somebody, the God of heaven, that so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I said that, I said that, I'm sorry. I repent in dust and ashes. We're looking at chapter 17, verse 6. Chapter 17, and we're looking at verse 6. Chapter 17, verse 6. He has made me also a byword of the people. And at four time, I was as a tablet. As a tablet. And then we come to chapter 19, verse 6. Chapter 19, verse 6. Know now that God has overthrown me. God has overthrown me. And he has compassed me with his net. Behold, I cry out of wrong. But... I have not heard. I cry aloud. But there is no judgment. He has fenced up my way that I cannot pass. He has set darkness in my past. He has stripped me of my glory. And has taken the crown from my head. He said it's God that did that. That's why later when he realized all that he said. 
It was his thought, the wrong thought, that caused the wrong utterance. That's why he now said, I repent. You see, when you come to realize who God is, when you come to realize the favor of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the calling of God upon your life, and then you realize what you have been thinking. Because in the case of Job, his thoughts were wrong. In the case of Job, his words lacked divine revelation. He was ignorant of God's purpose and God's plan. He was ignorant of the discussion that went on between God and Satan. How God was bragging concerning him. How God was saying, have you seen my servant Job? There's nobody like him. I'm proud of him. I love him. And, Job, and Satan said, ah, Job is a wise man. He's serving you because of everything you've given him. And you make an edge around him. He said, not, God said, not Job. Job serves me for sincerity. Okay, take away the edge and do whatever. You will discover that Job is still serving me. That's why Satan went out and then troubled him like that and took all the edge away. And Job said, Naked did I come from my mother's womb, and naked will I return to God. God has given and God has taken away. Blessed be his holy name. And then God called Satan and said, Satan, didn't I tell you that man is perfect? That man is great, and that man is really holy and righteous. Ah, Satan said, but you know, man, now, scheme for scheme, you have not touched his body. If you touch that man's body, he'll forsake you. He'll backslide. He'll become an apostate. He'll become another sin, your enemy. Okay? You can go and touch him, but don't touch his life. And then Satan came and filled him with boils all over. And then, uh, you know, was scratching himself. And yet he said, he would not sin against God. He will not forsake God. God was actually bragging concerning him. And God was saying, I'm making this one a specimen, a showpiece, and a wonder in the world. But Job did not understand. It was that lack of understanding you know, that made him to say what he said. His thoughts were wrong. When your thoughts fall short of God's thoughts, when you discover, you need to repent. When your plans are conceived in ignorance and unbelief, here is the plan of God for the church. Here is the plan of God for growth. Here is the plan of God so that he wants to get people in your community saved. And then you say, how can that happen? You're talking about our community here. You're talking about these people. And your thoughts are not the thoughts of God. Your plans are not the plans of God. As you now come to understand that you have been planning in ignorance and unbelief, it's time for you to repent. When your words accuse God wrongly. Your words accuse God wrongly. How was I born in Nigeria? Does God have any hand in where I am born? How could I be here? Why was I not born in that other place? In that other place. You say you are a Christian. You say you are a child of God. Of course, yes. And you say that you love God. You read the Bible. Yes, I'm only asking God the question. Why am I born in Nigeria? Look at what you are going through. When you now realize that those things you said, you were accusing God wrongly. That's when you come and you repent. When your discussion does not recognize what has happened at Calvary. Because the discussion of Job did not recognize what happened in the great beyond. And there is a hill far away that is called Calvary. And something happened there. That Satan was defeated. And that man was redeemed. When your discussion and your plan and your project and everything you are thinking about yourself, about your family and about the church does not tally, does not agree with what happened at Calvary. You need to repent. When you don't give any acknowledgement to Christ's resurrection on the throne. It's now at the right hand of God and it's making intercession for us. And the intercession he makes for us is that you will be strong and we're going to be strong. 
and that he builds his church upon the rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Give me a good amen. amen. That's the intercession he's making now. Right there on the right hand side of God and when your thoughts, when your plans, when your project, when your planting of churches does not recognize or acknowledge the uh, intercession of Christ over there at the right hand side of majesty on high on, on the throne then you need to repent when you don't have C C C as your point of reference what I mean is you don't have his cross you don't have his commission you don't have his coronation as your point of reference in anything you're doing. You come to church. Why? What's your point of reference? You work for the Lord. Why? What's your point of reference? You say you are now getting into planting church here, planting church here. What's your point of reference? When your point of reference has nothing to do with his cross. It has nothing to do with his commission has nothing to do with his coronation when you don't make him the point of reference in everything you're doing as you come to god you realize what are we planning what are we doing why is our vision so small why is he so little what's the point of reference of everything we're planning that's why you come to god like job you say lord now i understand and i repaid in dust and ashes that's your first step you are climbing up once you do that and you say i'm climbing up i'm climbing up i'm going up you'll go up in jesus name point number two the soaring progress of a small congregation the soaring process progress of a small congregation we're coming to chapter eight of job verse seven job chapter eight Verse 7, though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Do I have any amen in the house? You will increase. You will grow. You will multiply. And look at Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. And I'm reading from verses 1 and 5. Exodus chapter 1. We're looking at verse 1. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came of Jacob. Verse 5. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were how many people? Seventy souls for, Jake, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Now, the beginning was small. The beginning was small. Come to chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12. And here we're reading from verse 37. The beginning was small. How many were they? Tell me out loud. Seventy. Is that up to one hundred? Is that up to 1,000? Answer now. Now Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Zuccoth. About, tell me, 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. They greatly increased. You were greatly increased. Deuteronomy chapter 1. We're looking at verse 10, Deuteronomy chapter 1, reading from verse 10. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are, and bless you as he has promised you. He will bless you as he has promised you. Do you see here that even though the beginning was small, yet they greatly increased. And that's the same thing the Lord is telling us. He's telling you as an individual soul winner. 
as an individual minister, as an individual pastor preacher. He's telling you as a family. He's telling us as assemblies and congregations. Look at Job, he greatly increased. And look at Israel, they greatly increased. Churches in our communities will increase. Churches in the cities will increase. So few and small, we can become greatly increased. As I've said, let me say it again. Little will become large. Small will become significant. But how will that happen? How will that happen? Because now we're talking about the soaring progress of a small congregation. It will happen when we rely on God's promises. When we look away from what was thought before, what was said before, how we prayed before, how long we have been here and we're still like this, when we forget that. And we don't rely, number one, on the promises of God. Number two, when we abandon faithless mindset. Faithless mindset. A kind of mindset that will be thinking of the past. Oh, the people here, this is how they are. The situation here, this is how it is. And the work here, this is how it is. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter how many times you pray and preach and fast, this is where we always are. When you abandon that kind of mindset, faithless mindset. Number three, when you think the thoughts of God. And you say, God can do what he says he can do. God will do what he says he will do. Jesus said, upon this rock I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When you dwell in Canaan. While walking through the wilderness. Look at that. Look at that. What that means is this. Here you are. You are walking through the wilderness. But you take your heart. So to say. You throw it over. Unto Canaan. And your heart is dwelling in Canaan land. But only your body is here. And your body is moving to catch up. With your heart in Canaan. That's how the promise is fulfilled. Because your heart is the central part of your life. It's the essential part of your life. You transfer that heart. You promote that heart. You send that heart to Canaan. And your heart is thinking of Canaan. And your heart is dwelling in Canaan. While your body is still walking over here in the wilderness. Very soon your body will catch up with your heart. And the totality of you will be in Canaan in Jesus name. When you believe and you persevere to see God's glory in manifestation. That's how the promise will be fulfilled. That's how the small will become significant. That's how the little will become large. But you know the problem? 40 years of grasshopper mentality in the wilderness conditions the mind to perpetual weakness. 40 years like thinking like a grasshopper. You wake up in the morning, I'm a grasshopper. You're sleeping in the night, I'm a grasshopper. And you're going on the street, this is grasshopper street. And if nothing ever moves here. Church here is not like church in the other place. Spirituality here is not like spirituality in the other place. Because you are walking with the mentality of the grasshopper. There are giants in that land. And because the giants are there, what can we do? When you walk like that for 40 years, you are going to condition your mind to weakness. You condition your mind to smallness. You condition your mind to stagnation. You condition your mind to littleness. You condition your mind to impotence and inability. You, con you condition your mind to fewness, self-abasement, self-depreciation, and false humility. You say, well, we accept where we are. We accept who we are. We accept where we are planting churches. Nothing can grow here. Nothing can move here. Well, you've been thinking like that for 40 years. You understand 40 years? 40 years? Let me explain 40 years to you. 1977 to 2017... That's 40 years. 
when you remember that you came across deeper life in 1977. Or when you remember the first church here came 19 such and such. And then you calculate the number of years. Almost 40 years will be here. And then you'll be thinking the same way. The same mentality. And the same thought. We're grasshoppers. We're grasshoppers. We'll never catch up with Lagos. We'll never catch up with you know, the headquarters. We'll never catch up with this and that. Here is where we are. We are backward and we'll always be backward. Grasshopper mentality. When you repent of that, growth will come. Yeah. When you turn away from that, growth will come. Yeah. From small congregation to a great congregation. From a few congregations to many congregations. From little to much. From weak to strong. Lord, I believe. Somebody there, Lord, I believe. Individual repentance. Personal repentance. Corporate repentance. Congregational repentance. When the whole body of Christ in this community, when we all come together and we say, we'll be thinking like grasshoppers, and all these many years, almost 40 years, we'll be thinking like this. Now we come corporately as an assembly. Corporately, with all the pastors, with all the teachers, with all the ministers, all the things we have been saying, you know, we're satisfied with that kind of church building. Because, you know, this is all we are. There's no money here. There's money here. I see it, it's only there's no money with you. Look at the town and look at all those big, big buildings. There's money there with the unbelievers, but there's no money with the believers. There's money here. Yeah. I said, there's no money here. You are riding a car. There's no money here. There's no money here. You built a house. I see there is no money. I see there is no money. You are wearing a better suit than I'm wearing. And then there is no money. There is money here. Yeah. I said, there is money here. And the Lord will make all the resources of this land will flow the way of the church in Jesus' name. Because we're going to grow. I said we're going to grow. If you will plant, the Lord will give the increase. If you will work, the Lord will give you the progress. By looking at Psalm 107, verse 35, Psalm 107. We're looking at verse 35. Psalm 107. Tell me your verse. Verse 35. It says, He turneth the wilderness into a standing water. I thought somebody would say, Amen. And dry ground into water springs. And there He maketh the hungry to dwell. That they may prepare a city for habitation. You will prepare the city for habitation in Jesus' name. Verse 37, and so fill some plant vineyards which may yield fruit of increase. He blesses them also. So that they are multiplied, how? Greatly, and suffered not their cattle to decrease. The day of increase has come. The time of increase has come. Great congregation. Great congregations. Psalm 22. I'm reading from verse 25. Psalm 22 verse 25. My prayer shall be of thee. In the great congregation. Our congregations will not be small anymore. It says. My prayer shall be, shall be of thee. In the great congregation. I will pay my vows. Before them. That fear him. We're looking at chapter 40. Verse 7. Chapter 40 of the Psalms. Verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. If the volume of the book is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness. In what kind of congregation? In the great congregation. Great congregation. Lord is, the Lord is going to give us now real translation transportation and it's going to move us up small congregations are going to become large great congregations in jesus name it says lo i have not refrained my leaves oh lord thou knowest verse 10 i have not hidden 
thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from what kind of congregation? Great congregation. That's what your congregations are becoming. We're looking at Psalm 68. Psalm 68, how this will happen. Psalm 68, verse 10. In Psalm 68, verse 10, it tells us in verse 10, thy congregation, whose congregation is this? I said whose congregation is this? Congregation of the Lord, thy congregation has dwelt therein, thou, O God, has prepared thy goodness for the poor. You are not poor anymore. The goodness of God, the riches of God prepared for you because he wants the congregation here to be great, to be mighty, to be multiplied. How will that happen? Look at verse 11. The Lord gave the word. Tell me. Great was a company of those that published it. If you will, you know, come away from just looking, from just, uh, you know, folding your hand, you come out. The Lord has given the word and is telling us now that the small shall become significant. Give me a good amen. He's telling us little shall become large. Another amen. He's saying that the few shall become fruitful. Another amen. When you realize that the Lord has given the word and great was the company of those that published it to join the people of God and we're going to do this work together. Look at verse 27. Verse 27, there is, there is little Benjamin, little Benjamin with their ruler, princes of Judah, their council, and princes of Zebulun. And the princes of Naphtali, the Lord has commanded thy strength. The Lord has commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us, the Lord will do it. When that happens, what will follow? Verse 31, princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing, praises unto the Lord. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he does send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. That is coming your way now. We're looking at Psalm 105, Psalm 105, and we're reading from verse 12. Psalm 105, we're reading from verse 12. 12, 105, verse 12. When they were but few men in number, yea, very few and strangers in each, very few and strangers in each. Today, look around, maybe we're few, but growth has come. Look at verse 24. He increased his people greatly. What did he do? He increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. You'll be happy you are part of the church at a time like this. Because prosperity has come. Progress has come. Multiplication has come. Movement of church planting has come. You are going to be part of it in Jesus' name. Point number three, the saints' penetration of a shielded community. The saints' penetration of a shielded community. What does that mean? Shielded community. A community that is caged in. A community that is kept away. A community that is, re that is uh, uh, removed in towns and villages. A community that is uh, kept far away by a river. And people say, there's a river between here and there. And those people, they're shielded. They're cut off. We cannot plant churches there. We may have some few people there who are able to come to us over here on the island. But we cannot cross over to the other side. But now, we're talking about the saints of God. Any saint of God here today? I said any saint of God here today, we're going to penetrate all the shielded communities. 
The shielded by the river will penetrate them. They shield them by their farms, all those farmers. They don't even come to the city or town. They shielded, they're shielded there. Oh, they only come maybe at times of their festival. At the times of, uh, you know, some spectacular things taking place in town. The shielded there were penetrating them in those plantations. And then some are shielded by tradition, long standing tradition. We're going to break through all those traditions and we're going to penetrate them. Some are shielded by religion. You understand? Religion. You talk to them. In the past, I had my religion. And then you say, okay, I'm sorry. Now we're not going to be sorry for anybody. I said you'll not be sorry for anybody. I come to you with good news. I come to you. Yes, I know you have your religion. But you're going to get something from me today that you never got in your life before. Your life will turn around and something good will happen to you. Then you will say, I didn't know that. Give it to me. And then you give the gospel to them. The shielded by church denomination. I go to church. I have my church. I have this. I have that. They have been shielded. They are shielded by false prophets. And they are, they are kind of glued to those false prophets. And they have shielded them. Some people are shielded by the high class society. And that high class society shields them away. But now the time has come for penetration. Are you ready? There is going to be penetration in Jesus' name. Penetration. Inside that penetration, there is saturation planting. Saturation planting. We plant here. We plant here. We plant there. We plant there. Every seat, every street, every community, every local government, all those villages, everywhere, we're going to plant churches in Jesus' name. That's what is called the systematic possession. Systematic possession. We possess this area. We possess this area. I was waiting for amen. We possess that area. Systematically, we're going to possess in Jesus' name. The steadfast perseverance. You will not be tired. Look up here. I am not tired. I said, I am not tired. Like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. Like parents, like children. You will not be tired in Jesus' name. There's going to be steady progress. Not that today we are up, tomorrow we are down. Today we are running and then tomorrow we are crawling. Not that today we are climbing the mountain and then tomorrow we are going down the valley. There's going to be steady progress. There's going to be step by step planning and performance. Planning and performance. There are some people, they only plan, plan, plan and plan. They never go out to the practical field and then go and perform. But things have changed. There's going to be supernatural participation. The Lord will work with you. The Lord will go with you. We're talking about the penetration of the saints. Penetration of the saints. Look at Joshua. Chapter 1, mark this in your Bible. This is your verse tonight. I said this is your verse tonight. In Joshua chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. But you know, a person that is always sitting in his house, let's go out for soul winning, is sitting down in the house, is not moving. It's the people who are moving that will be multiplied. That you claim this, you come here. You claim that, you come there. You come there, you claim that. Let your feet step every village in a community. Get to every town. Once your feet step there, once you get there and you just walk around, do some Jericho march around, you don't have to shout, you are walking by, I claim this for Jesus. You are walking by, I claim this for Jesus. 
you are walking by, there's going to be a church there for Jesus. And then you go to that, and then you think, look at the map, take the map, and look at every village, and look at every community, and look at every street, and look at every avenue, and look at every geographical location, and let your feet get there, let your feet get there, let your feet get there. You're going to possess in Jesus' name. And now the Lord will walk with you. Look at Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Are you there? Mark chapter 16, verse 20. I'm waiting for you to open the Bible. Are you there now? Okay, if you are there, uh, begin to read it. One, two, three, go. Praise the Lord, you are going forth. I said you are going forth. You are not sit back anymore, you are going forth. Your backbone will not be weak. You are going forth. Your feet will not be weak. You are going forth. Your voice will not faint away. You are going forth. And then you are going to have the vision of an eagle. You find a church there, a church there, a church there, a church there. The Lord will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He has given the promise. He will fulfill the promise in Jesus' name. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them. The Lord walking with them. The Lord will walk with you. Confirming the word with signs following. With signs following. With signs following. What are you? Are you part of this team? A progressive team. A church planting team. A, a, a team that will multiply. Multiplication. Where are you? Increase, where are you? Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, the time has come for you. The time has come for us. We're going to multiply. We're going to multiply. We're going to multiply. This is the time. This is the time. We're the salt of the earth. And let the salt get everywhere. And we are the light of the world. Let the light get everywhere. Such a rage. Saturate, saturate all the places in this land and let us have church everywhere. He said, even though you are small, you will greatly, greatly, greatly increase. The increasing time has now come. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.